Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're in chapter eight, estimating with confidence. This time we're in section two. So it's all about estimating a population proportion. At the end of this six section, we should be able to state and check the random 10%, which is the independent, and large counts, which is the normal conditions for constructing a confidence interval for a population proportion. Very important, pay attention to the details on that, and especially when you're working on your practice problems, make sure you follow the instructions very carefully. Determine critical values for calculating a C% percent confidence interval for a population proportion using a table or using technology. Construct and interpret a confidence interval for a population proportion, and determine the sample size required to obtain a C confidence, C percent confidence interval for a population proportion with a specified margin of error. By the way, we didn't really talk about it in section one, but we have a ton of new vocabulary in chapter eight. So make sure you have an understanding of all of the different terms and you can interpret them in context. So not only will you be successful on multiple choice, which we know has a tendency to be very concept and definition and interpretation heavy, but also on those free response questions, I want you to be able to do a good job on those. Okay, so we have a container full of colored beads, and our goal is to estimate the proportion of red beads in the entire container. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a sample of beads. That sample will yield a a group of beads, a sample of beads that are either red or not red. So we're able to come up with a point estimate from our sample, a P hat from our sample to try to estimate P from the container of beads, the big container of beads. We want to be able to find a 95% confidence interval, which is our estimate, remember a range of plausible values for our population proportion we want to make sure to check conditions. Then we're going to compare results with other teams in the class, or we may do it as a whole class. Now, we have an example in our textbook that talks about a teacher whose class did this, and the simple random sample that they got had 107 red beads and 144 not red beads. So our point estimate p hat would be calculated by dividing 107 by 251. 251 is the sum of 107 and 144, so the total number of beads in the sample. We end up with two, three decimal places, 0.426. How can we use this information to find a confidence interval for our population proportion P? Well, we know that this is a binomial setting because uh, it fits the bins, all the different characteristics we learned in chapter six. But we also learned about the normal approximation to the binomial. And if our sample size is large enough that our number of successes, NP, and our number of failures, N times one minus P, are at least 10, 10 or more, then we know that the sampling distribution of all of the P hats is approximately normal. We follow the normal condition if it meets that condition, we can use normal procedures, which means calculating probabilities using z-scores. We know that the center of our sampling distribution of p hat is p, the actual population proportion. And we know that we can use the formula for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of p hat if we meet the independent condition which restricts our sample size to no more than 10% of our population size. So the truth is we don't know the value of P. That's what we're trying to estimate. We're using the confidence interval to actually estimate for P. And in large samples, P hat will be close to P. So what that means is because we don't actually know P, we're gonna to need to use P hat in place of P when we check the normal condition, which is the N times P and N times one minus P, we're also going to have to use it in our standard deviation formula, which is gonna become a standard error formula, the standard deviation of the sample.
So this is what our three conditions are going to look like. Random is an absolute must, as we learned about in section 8.1. We absolutely have to have the data coming from a well-designed random sample or randomized experiment. Then we have the standard deviation requirement for independence. We're going to be checking our 10% rule. And then we have the large counts, which we can also call the normal condition, our number of successes and failures being at least 10. If those three conditions are met, then we're going to be able to use our four-step process, our state plan do conclude, to construct and interpret our confidence intervals for proportions. So our confidence interval is always going to be in this format that we talked about in section one, the sample statistic, which in this case is our p-hat, plus or minus, the critical value times the standard deviation of the statistic, otherwise known as a standard error. The product critical value times standard deviation of the statistic is our margin of error. We're going to be using that standard deviation formula, but instead of using p, we're going to be using p hat because, of course, we don't know p. That's what we're trying to estimate. So we're going to use our sample proportion in the formula to calculate the standard error, and that's what we're going to be plugging into our formula for margin of error. Next, we need to figure out how to find the critical value. And if you look at this graphic, you can see that if we want a 95% confidence level for our interval, what's left over, 1, which is the area under the curve, minus 0.95, leaves 0.05. That means on the left, we have half of that, 0.025, and on the right, we have half of that, 0.025. When we look on table A, at the Z score, for the Z score, for an area of 0.025 reading from the left hand side, then we find this number negative 1.96 is the Z score. So if we want to use a 95% confidence interval, knowing that we have the 6895 99.7 rule, one, 1.96 is very close to 2. So that's two standard deviations to the left of the center of our standard normal, which is zero, and two standard deviations to the right. Really, it's 1.96, but we estimate to two in chapter two. We can find the z-score using table A or using the bottom of table B, which we'll talk about later, or we can use our calculator with inverse norm. Inverse norm is where we use the area to come up with the z-score. And this is going to give us our critical value z star for plugging into our confidence interval format. So let's say we want to find the critical value z star for an 80% confidence interval. We're going to assume that the large counts condition is met. So that means we can use the normal distribution curve. So we see a curve here. We have 80% in the middle. That means what's left over is 20%. We split that on the left and on the right. And then we go to our table A at the probability of 0 0.10, 0 .10, and we find the z-score. If you look on table A, the closest value of the probabilities to point, exactly 0.10 is this number, 0 0.1003. And we can see the z star then is going to, the, or the z score associated with that probability is negative 1.28. So that is our negative z score. We know that there's symmetry with this standard normal curve, so the z star on the other side is going to be positive 1.28 giving us our plus or minus of 1.28 for our 80% confidence interval. So once we know everything to plug into our confidence interval formula, we know we're only taking one sample. We'll talk about taking two samples in, in another chapter, not right now, but this is going to be a one sample Z interval for population proportion. And we're going to be able to also use a calculator feature called one prop Z int to come up with the same interval. Now remember, we still need to show all of the work associated, so we're only going to use that calculator feature to check our interval and make sure it's correct.
So when conditions for inference are met, we're going to be able to construct a C% percent confidence interval for the estimate of our population proportion using this format. And basically, you can treat it like a formula. This is on our formula sheet, but it doesn't look exactly like this. So back to the bead example, suppose we take a simple random sample from the container of a large population of beads and we get 107 red beads and 144 white or non-red beads. We want to calculate and interpret a 90% confidence interval for the proportion of red beads in the container. We're trying to estimate the proportion of red beads in the container. So the teacher claims that 50% of the beads are red. Let's see what we think once we do the math. We've come up with our p hat. The sample proportion is 0.426. We already checked conditions. We are coming up with a z star from table A for 0.5, because if it's 1 minus 0.90, that leaves 10. And we split that, so 0.05, and we end up with a z star of 1.645. We plug everything that we now know into our format for a confidence interval. And remember, we can write our confidence interval two different ways. The first one is the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. The second one is our lower boundary comma, our upper boundary. Our conclusion is going to be the last thing that we write, and it's going to be in this format as we saw previously. We are 90% confident that the interval from 0.375 to 0.477 captures or contains or includes the true proportion of red beads in the container. So this is how you're going to model your conclusion. Now this interval gives a range of plausible values for the population proportion and we notice the teacher's claim of 50% beads being red that's not even in our interval in our range of plausible values. So we do not believe the teacher's claim. The four-step process is going to be that state plan do conclude format. We're going to be doing it for the rest of the year, so get comfortable with it. We'll talk more about this in class. There's another very important type of problem that we see in this chapter, and it is selecting a sample size that is big enough to give us the margin of error that we want, using the confidence level that we're interested in, but not so big so that we're spending extra money sampling more individuals than we need to or experimenting on more individuals that we need to than we need to so we can see the margin of error formula the z star times the standard error and imagine that we're going to rearrange that to be able to solve for n we need to think of our worst case scenario p hat and as it turns out it's 0.5 so the margin of error is largest when we have a 0.5 proportion. So our formula is going to end up after we rearrange for whoopsie for um, n, you're going to see that we are able to calculate the smallest sample size necessary to get the margin of error that we want. We have an example here. I'm going to ask you to pause the video so you can read the example. The important information is we know our margin of error is going to be 0.03 and we know our confidence level is going to be 95%. We need to find how large a sample do we need to survey. So we find our Z star of 1.96 either from table A, table B, or from inverse norm for 95% confidence. We know our worst scenario P hat is 0.5. And we know we mar want a margin of error of no more than 0.03. So we plug all of that into our formula and we solve for n. We come up with an n of 1067.111 and that tells us we need to have at least 1068 people in our survey to make sure that we get a margin of error of no more than 3%. We can't cut off that 0.111 because we have to have at least 1067.111 people surveyed to get the margin of error we need, so we have to round up every single time. We have hit all of our objectives. We know how to check the conditions. We know how to find our Z star. We know how to construct and interpret our confidence interval, and we know how to 
get the smallest sample size necessary. So time to do homework and see you back in class.